What I'm going to talk about um, is conflict behaviours in the workplace. And there are challenging behaviours that I think we all find it difficult to, to deal with. Not only the behaviours of others, but sometimes our own behaviours can be challenging for us to manage. Um, so I'd like it to be something that you identify with. So maybe before we start, can anybody just give me an example of the types of behaviours that they particularly find challenging? You don't like to be angry. Yes, I know. And it's very, it's one that's really, you know, I don't find it conflict. Absolutely. Anything else? Aggressive. Aggressive behavior. Yeah, very aggressive. Defensive. Passive aggressive. Personally, I find passive aggressive a difficult one because it's very difficult to know how to do it. Absolutely. So they're all very unpleasant. And the types of behaviours that we particularly look at are the following. So some of them you've, you've already identified, apologies, I'll get to them on the next slide, but we're looking at differences where people see the situations differently. And that's the kind of culture that we want. We've just heard about how culture is such an important part of the environment. An important part of an organisation, an important part of a productive environment for us to work in where we want to be on the receiving end of behaviours that inspire us, that encourage us. But the anger, the tensions, the passive aggression, the hostility, these are the behaviours that can take us from that, that inspiring environment into one of conflict. So when we, when we go from that green environment where people understand each other's perspectives and they don't feel discomfort in discussing things in a difference. They see it as a positive and creative problem-solving environment. But sometimes those differences grow to having a negative impact on us, where people now begin to express anger or begin to feel defensive. Um, there's tension and anger, and there are routine walkaways or power plays that we experience. And they can continue to develop if they're not managed correctly into disputes. And this is where, where the conflict is poorly managed, uh, mostly due to lack of appropriate skills, that it grows to become a dispute, and the relationship is on the verge of termination. There's a, a risk of violation of laws and or our ethics, or our values, as the previous speaker spoke about. Um, there can be actually extreme reactions or violence. So that's where we don't want to get to. And what we're about is how do we manage behaviours and keep us in that green, positive, inspiring, productive environment. So I spoke about the behaviours a moment ago that, that people find challenging and unpleasant to deal with. Um, we're going to look at a number of these. Unappreciative, when somebody is unappreciative for us, they never praise performance or appreciate the efforts that, that go into fulfilling a task. That can be very difficult to be around on a constant basis. Hostile. They use, they, they raise their voices, they're quite aggressive and hostile to us. Overly analytical. We may not identify these kinds of behaviours, but somebody who are working with, who only sees the detail and can't see the bigger picture, can be very frustrating for somebody who's more strategic or who likes to see the bigger picture. Again, self-centred, somebody who is always right. How difficult is it to work with somebody who is always right? You feel your, contrib your contribution isn't valued. Abrasive. You know the person who's sarcastic? Or who always has a bit of a singer, or throws their eyes to heaven, but has a way of making you feel, again, undervalued and put down. Again, a very unpleasant behavior. Um, aloofness. Many times when I mediate, I often mediate, and people say, oh, they're just not a team player. You know, they, they don't get involved in team activities. They don't offer their contribution. And micromanaging, that's a favourite. Um, when we feel that there's always something over our shoulder, checking us, not enabling us to you know, work on our own mission. And unreliable. Are never there at the time they're supposed to be there, don't have um, you know, the reports we need done, don't contribute to the deadlines that we need to meet. 
Many of these behaviours, and untrustworthy, the way they exploit other people, many of these behaviours show up daily in our workplaces. And they are what we call, they can become our hot buttons. They're the behaviours that trigger us into conflict, that spark that fight or flight response in us, that we're all familiar with, where we become defensive. I don't know, does that sound familiar to you in any way? Yeah? Is everybody able to recognize a behavior that just irritates them? And it's that, that experience that we try to work with, that we try to influence in a constructive way so that it doesn't take hold. You know in a team where you're working with somebody um, or amongst a group where you feel that there's, there are two people who aren't getting on very well, it's very contagious. And it can really undermine the positivity of the group and therefore the productivity of the group. So what we try to do is to help people to become self-aware of their own triggers and how to manage them. And then how to work with other people, with managers particularly, who have to manage the conflict of their direct reports. And how do I manage that as a manager without getting sucked into the conflict? So, what we look at is your organization's conflict management <coughs> strategy. And that is made up, first of all, of your conflict culture. So the last speaker who was here spoke a lot about the culture of an organization and how important it is. Now, I sent out a link to a survey for you to undertake before the workshop. Did anybody receive that? No? Well, well that's pity. Well, you, you had an opportunity to, um, to take the survey and for you to identify what your organization's culture, conflict culture is. Um, because again, as many of the speakers have spoken about today, it's possible to measure these things. I don't think there's any point in us talking about strategies for change and strategies to address things, unless we can measure them and we can see what is the impact of our efforts to address these situations. Um, so it's something that is measurable, and if anybody's interested, I can give you the link to the survey that I'm talking about. Um, but it measures our attitudinal and our behavioural norms. What are the norms and the attitudinal behaviours in my organisation around this interpersonal conflict that is part and parcel of every relationship, every, every um, team? You cannot be in an organisation without there being conflict. Um, it's not possible. Many organisations that I go into to uh, talk to them about conflict management say, yeah, we like what you're doing, but you call it something else. Yeah. They don't like the name, the title of conflict management. It suggests a negative, because we use negative words, and our experience of conflict is mostly negative. But in fact, once we delve more into the subject, it can become, we can turn that into a positive. Because conflict is neither positive or negative, it's what we bring to it that will determine whether it's positive or negative. So we look at the conflict culture, and then we also look at the conflict competencies. How confident, as a manager, am I in managing conflict? And just a little statistic, 80% of non-managers, of people who are not managers, believe that their managers are not good at having conflict. So if any of you are managers, you probably need to be aware that the likelihood is that most of your team, your team, think you are not good. Um, managers themselves will. This is not. It's just, no, no. Managers themselves uh, will uh, support that. About seventy percent of managers say they themselves think they're not good. So this is an area that really does need much more focus because up to now, traditionally, conflict in the workplace was seen more as an industrial relations issue, where you had more group cases like or hours of work, or you know, wanting to flex the time, or there were, there were more industrial relations issues. Whereas the expansion of employment legislation, our education, and changing workplaces that are more linear and hierarchical, are now bringing many more individual conflict um, disputes to, to HR. And HR is now much more, um, I suppose, focused on and being asked to uh, 
sorts these individual conflicts and grievances. And um, it's taking a lot of HR time, and so more and more HR is needed to um, work with their managers <laughs> and ask of their managers. Um, so competencies, conflict competencies, are very important in today's workforce, today's workplaces, where managers are now being asked to manage many of these individual disputes that are arising, because it is not within HR's um, scope to be able to manage. So the more confident your managers are, the better. And then lastly, organizational conflict management structures is how good and how developed is your organization in putting in place policies, and procedures, and roles? Or do you have people in-house who are trained to, to mediate, to coach, to train in, in, in conflict management? And um, what are the policies of the organization? Does a, does a complaint immediately go into a formal grievance process? Or do, do you have <coughs> informal tools, techniques, and um, possibilities for different methods for, for resolving and managing conflict before it becomes formal? So these are all the things that we, we look at supporting organizations to do. Okay. 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 <laughs> so what is the conflict uh, culture of your organization? So we talked about it being the attitudinal and behavioural norms that determine how employees think, or must think, or portray themselves as thinking, and act to be accepted and approved of by others, and to be successful in their careers. That's, that's your corporate culture, your organisational culture. Um, it's not recorded, as the previous speaker said, in formal documents or official documents. It resides in the shared perceptions, the shared beliefs, um, attitude and values of the members. As Peter Drucker so famously said, culture means strategy for breakfast. You can have beautiful documents. You can have wonderfully developed organizational channels. You can have fabulous value statements on your walls. But unless you have the culture, the attitude, the perceptions, the beliefs, the shared understanding that these are our values, this is our culture, the focus. So, the survey that I asked you, that I uh, sent around, um, was one which looked at four different types of cultures and gave you um, a grade or a, a ranking of each one for your organisation. So, it looks at the behavioural dimension, how people act. Because remember, behaviour, behavioural norms are a very important part of every culture. Um, are people disengaged from? Others are, are they engaged with others. Then we looked at uh, how people think. Do they have a non-adversarial approach towards the other or an adversarial? And that is really critical. Do they see people as potential partners, as potential collaborators, or potential enemies? Or people they need to be defensive around? And that the the the, the I suppose the um, four different types of cultures that are measured are ones of detachment, evasion, collaboration, or coercion. And obviously, the one we're looking for is a culture of collaboration. For all the reasons of productivity, of well-being, of all of the things we're trying to achieve um, in our focus today. So, this was a, a, a survey that was done previously, and in the case of this particular company, evasion was 5.91. So anything over 5, 5 or over 5 is very, very significant. That would be the dominant uh, culture in that organisation. The lowest one is being collaboration. So again, remember, it's measurable. So this can inform the strategy that that company will adopt to manage its conflict, its interpersonal conflict, and to create a culture and to look at how to instill and how to support the behaviours and the mindset that's going to engage people in a collaborative culture. So just to give you a little bit more information about these, if the culture of your organisation is one of evasion, so this is the conflict culture in which you work, dis disputes will be suppressed and avoided. So many of those companies that would say to me, no, we don't have any other one here. I kind of say, well, then you don't have people with the policies because you do have a culture. It is impossible to have a group of people who don't, do not experience conflict. 
Um, there's little direct confrontation or open hostility. So you don't have that open hostility. You know, that, that term we don't have. But there's an atmosphere of superficial friendliness that masks underlying resentments. So there's this kind of superficiality that, that masks a lot of things that are going on beneath the surface. There's low trust, and there's a sense that I'm not so sure that the person I'm under will really hold back from me. That there is a sense that somebody else could harm my interests. Um, and people in authority may appear paternalistic or viewed with suspicion. Um, as I say, that they wouldn't be supportive or go to the platform. Does anybody recognise that type of environment? Yeah? Let's see if you have heads nodding. Um, and it's very interesting because um, there's, a, there's a guy, Dan Dana, who, who was very, um, an American writer and um, practitioner in this whole area of conflict management, and he says that conflict is the least recognised but the most reducible cost in companies today. Which again is quite similar to the message that was coming out in the last workshop. That we, we haven't been very good at actually outing the conflict, or naming it, or dealing with it. And I think that's because we haven't really known how to up to now. Because many of our processes are formal, they're rights-based, but a rights-based system which is critically important to create an environment of employment and you know, rights and entitlements and an environment where, where dignity at work is honoured and preserved, that's all very fine. But a rights-based approach will not engage you in a discussion around you know, um, the culture and the mindset and thinking, those interactions that are needed to create that collaborative, the collaborative culture. So, um, the reason why these cultures prevail is because employees don't have the competencies to do it differently. Don't have the competencies to manage differently, to lead differently, to inspire a collaborative approach. So that's the invasion. And if we were to look similarly at coercion, where there is adversarial <coughs> engagement, we can see that conflicts are acted out openly. Now I do think that they're probably less common than the invasion, particularly in our society. Uh, but it, there are situations where people experience little need to hide their anger to maintain an image of decorum, where competitiveness is seen as a positive quality. Winners and losers are publicly identified, um, and people in authority exercise their power to actively control subordinates to avoid mistakes. And again, employees do not possess the competencies for managing conflict. Any of that recognisable? People. As I say, I think it's probably less evident than the evasive one in, in, in our particular culture. So then we look at um, the next one, detachment. And this, I think, is quite common, where employees have become disengaged or disinvested from the organisation. And um, paychecks and careers are valued, not the organisation. Work is seen as a means to an end rather than inherently meaningful and there's a defeatist attitude, that no longer fight against what is seen to be wrong. A little bit again, like the previous speaker, do I just work for the creche, for the childcare that I receive, for the paycheck that I get? But no real engagement, and there are many studies that suggest that up to 70 and 80 percent of people globally are disengaged from their workforce, from their workplace, so that they're not giving the favors, they're not giving that discretionary effort that, that is required to really truly make a, a company or an organisation creative and productive and a meaningful place to work where your well-being is valued and where you feel your well-being is valued. Um, incentive schemes are not effective and again people do not possess the competencies for managing conflict. So if we look at collaboration, which is what we're trying to achieve, we're trying to achieve a culture of collaboration where people feel valued and where well-being is probably maximised. Differences, disputes and conflicts exist because peace is not the absence of conflict, but it's the existence of options with which to deal with it. So a peaceful organisation is probably not a very creative one. And that's the challenge for us to see conflict as being potentially very creative and positive. But only if we begin to understand
understand it in a way that we can respond positively to it. So peace is not what we want, because peace would suggest everything is fine, there's no real energy around change, and therefore growth. So we do need some kind of stimulus to tell us we need to keep improving, we need to keep changing, we need to keep addressing things that, that, that still we haven't quite uh, achieved to our, to our best ability. There needs to be a level of disagreement, difference, and conflict. But how do we manage it is the key. So we need to have the options with which to deal with it. So conflicts are managed in a spirit of cooperation by constructive, direct communication. And this is what we, in our company, try to, in, um, I suppose, teach and instill in both employees and the managers and the organisation how to do this. People in authority provide support and remove obstacles to the productive work of their subordinates. And now employees possess core competencies for managing conflict. So how would you say you work in a collaborative organisation? If we were to describe it in that way? Yeah, some do. Good, good. And would you think that, would you agree that there are, there are ways of managing difference? But that is a, a valuable thing. To, to find the techniques and ways of addressing difference. So that's what we're, we're trying to, I suppose, encourage. So our approach is to say that conflict is inevitable, and it is possibly if it is not managed effectively. Um, it focuses on constructive behaviours. So we can talk about our intention not to, not to be defensive, not to be angry, or not to engage in conflict, but I think without learning the behaviours, that enable us to do that, we probably are not going to be successful. And we're not going to be able to instill in our organisation in a very explicit way what our expectations are around the behaviours of all people who work within our, our company. So we want to leverage the constructive energy and all of our work is really related to how do we constructively engage in conflict? What are the lots and lots of of doing it? How does that work? So one of the things we do is we have an assessment tool called the Conflict Dynamics Profile. And in response to all of those hot buttons that we identified, we are saying that you can actually have a destructive or a constructive response. So if somebody is hostile to me, or if somebody is very defensive and aloof toward me or ignores me, how do I behave? So I said earlier, conflict is neither positive nor negative, it's neither constructive or destructive, but it's what you bring to it that will turn that situation to a positive. So, on the, on the right hand side, on the well, left as you're looking at it, you will see the constructive. And we have active behaviours and passive behaviours. The active behaviours are perspective taking. What does that mean? What does perspective taking mean? Looking at the other side. Taking the perspective of the other. And how do you do that? Listen. So listening. And oftentimes, you know, I used to work with somebody who we talked at length. And I found it very frustrating. And I could not understand what was I doing because I would wait for her to finish speaking and then I would try to listen. But I was only waiting for her to stop talking. I wasn't listening. So it's what am I listening to? And how do I how do I listen constructively? So we, we, we look at how, how to do that and your skills and practices around that. But it's very important that I understand the other perspective is made up of the other person's values, of their needs, of how they see themselves. It's their belief system, their assumptions. So it's very important that we learn what are the what are what is the need that trigger? Why why am I particularly perturbed when somebody is um, micromanaging me? What is it that is particularly irritating to me when somebody is very aloof? I need to understand my drivers. So a lot of what the work we do in conflict management is about helping people to become aware of their own um, drivers in, in conflict. What is it that particularly hurts them? And that will go back to your value system, to your personal needs, and to your personal um, identity. So listening is really important, but we need to know what to listen for. Creating solutions. How do I engage somebody in creating solutions? Many people will say, well, I'm very creative and in conflict, but it still doesn't work. But it's engaging the other. 
what can we do about this? Because none of us are likely to know what to do. None of us are likely to dictate it. So it's about engaging with the other. What can we do together to solve the situation? And expressing emotions. Expressing emotions is probably, in my experience in the work that I've done with companies around, it's probably the least used of the constructive behaviors. I think we have a sense that you know, it's not appropriate to express emotions in the workplace. But the key here is to express the emotion, not to display it. So displaying emotion is about being angry, displaying emotion is about um, being tearful. Um, it's, it's being in the moment of the emotion. Whereas talking about your emotion, naming it. Many of you may have come across the whole concept of going to the balcony being the observer of your own emotion and being able to talk about what you're feeling, sharing how you see things with the other person. How many of you ever worked with somebody who doesn't express any emotion? Yeah? What's it like? How would you characterize the relationship? It's very hard because you haven't know where you stand with them. You don't know where you stand, so there's a sense of mistrust because you just cannot predict what will What's going on and so And when we don't know, often we fill in the blanks, you know, with a very negative um, judgment in our own minds. So expressing emotion is the first, I suppose, the, the, by the basic foundation of trust between people. It doesn't mean that you go in and pour your soul out to give them up. It doesn't mean that you have to be a book and book, but that you give your opinion and you say when you don't like something, and you say if you're disappointed or you're angry or you want it to be today rather than you're concerned, but you don't you know, become robotic. It, it's very detrimental to a conflict particularly. Reaching out. What does that mean? To reaching out. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, reach out to them. If the, if the situation has been difficult, and maybe it's broken down, the, 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 there's been a walk away, or, um, you know, there's been a walk out, then you go back. And you know, some people say, well, why should I? I wasn't wrong. Well, if we don't reach out to people, and if, we don't, if we're not the first to make the first move, then we're giving our power over to somebody else to say, well, I have to wait until they're there. You know, we need to turn a lot of these assumptions, a lot of what we've learned about conflict, into the positive and take ownership and make the first move because you are then in control of your response to that conflict. You're not giving your power away to somebody else. So it's about learning what is a constructive behaviour in conflict and how can I model that? And particularly if I'm a manager, I need to model that because that's how my direct reports, my supporters, will then learn, okay, that's what's expected of me. That's the culture we're working on here. Um, it's very difficult, or it's, it's, it's very, I suppose, um, ineffective to say to your team, well, I expect you to behave constructively, I expect you to listen, I expect you to do all these things, if you don't do that yourself. Um, then the more passive ones, which are the ones that are less obvious, are reflective thinking. Delaying, responding and adapting. What does reflective thinking involve? Do you think? Oftentimes when we're in conflict, you know, we will report extensively on what the other person has done, what they have said, uh, how they're to blame. Um, we will immediately blame the other. And if only they would change, if they would do this, if they would do that. And we have a little bit of business time. We've gone away, we've gotten all the evidence, and the evidence all stacks up, and it's perfect. But we've forgotten to put ourselves into the picture. So when we think reflectively, we look at the overall, we look at the full picture, and we try to reflect on what's been my contribution? What's their contribution? What's triggering them? What's triggering me? To take it in its round and to, to reflect what would be a positive um, intervention? What would I do that would be positive? So it's thinking more deeply um, about and taking the full perspective of the full picture. And that's where we oftentimes get back in touch with our own part to do something constructive. Um, adapting, delaying responding. Delaying responding is very much as it says, it's when your mother said you can't attend. You know, it's taking the time because when we're triggered, remember, we have in our minds and to the neuroscience of conflict tells us we've been hijacked. 
when we do terrible threat, that fight or flight reaction kicks in, if our brains are telling us we're under threat, we're being threatened in some way. Um, and what happens is the blood supply changes in our bodies. So now the, our amygdala tells our body to produce hormones and cortisol and chemicals that will actually change the flow of our blood supply. So our thinking brain, our prefrontal cortex, is being deprived of the blood flow and of oxygen and it's all going into the emotional way. So that in our earlier evolution, when we were in the wild, we didn't stop to wait and think if we saw an animal charging toward us. It was fight or flight. We either fought, said, wait, we did it, or we ran. In today's world, we don't have that many animals coming charging toward us, but we have people who threaten our psychological survival. How I want to be seen, how I, what, what I, how I see myself in the workplace, if I see myself as being a professional, being efficient, being um, caring, whatever, whatever I suppose role I wish to, to follow and I place value in, if somebody behaves in a way that undermines that, that's my psychological survival. It has the very same impact in my brain as a physical threat. And so therefore, we react in the same way, back to our basic, more primitive, protective mode, defensive mode, or fight, of fight or flight. We need, the bad news is that doesn't stop. Even if we're aware of it, that doesn't stop. But what we now do is we become self-aware. We know it's happening. So when we know it's happening, we can delay our response to wait for that hijack to pass. To wait until we can become more centered and calm and to make a decision about the best way to proceed. So in some of our workshops, um, you know, we, we ask people to kind of think about creative ways of, of I suppose, um, communicating these, these new techniques. And one person said, I want to have a big leg button here, you know, um, on my shoulder that I can just press to say stop. You know, like a, like a stop sign goes that you see on the road to say, I've been triggered and just stop. So delaying responding is really, really helpful when you find yourself quite agitated by somebody else's behaviour. And adapting. Adapting is being flexible. Being flexible and open to other people's suggestions, to other people's perspectives. And realising there are some things we can't change. There are scenarios that we can't change. That we need to accept for today and with the hope that in the future opportunities will arise to change things. But let's be flexible. It doesn't have to be my way. So, they're all the constructors. And what we're about is really increasing people's awareness through assessment profiles, through workshops and skills exercise in how to live this. How do I live in the green zone that enables me to accept difference as part and parcel of my everyday working life? Not to be threatened by it, not to feel defensive by it, and to deal with that individual comes in every morning and starts to micromanage me. How can I turn that around? Um, as opposed to living in the destructive. So we look on the destructive side and we see all of those behaviours we're well aware of, winning at all costs, you know, somebody who always has to have their own way. The cost becomes the relationship, the working relationship. Um, displaying anger, being very harsh, raising your voice, becoming very agitated, demeaning others, people down, retaliating, getting going back, or being obstructive, that passive obstructive person who just doesn't help, doesn't maybe tell you about a phone call that's come in, or doesn't help and they know that they could in some way make your life easier, very um, passively obstructive. Uh, they can also do things that do retaliate against you. Um, so it, it, they're very negative behaviours. and. In the passive zone, you have avoiding, yielding, hiding emotions, self-criticizing. Sometimes we don't even see these. We're not aware that people are doing them. And many people that we mediate would sometimes would say, oh, well, you know, I, I didn't say anything. Like, you know, and it's very obvious that um, they're to blame because they're the one that came in shouting and being, being very rude to me. I said nothing. But that saying nothing can really, really trigger other people. It's ignoring them, it's disrespecting people in a different way. 
ignoring, trying to stay out of their way, find their present and not speaking to them. You know, we've all sat in meetings where two people aren't speaking and it's very, very uncomfortable. Yielding, giving in for a peaceful life, or hiding emotions, pretending you're okay when you're not. I'd like that, not sharing how you feel. So people know you're not happy, they know there's something going on, but they don't quite know why. And self-criticizing. Self-criticizing is very interesting um, as a behavior. Uh, before I did this work, I thought that self-criticizing was just the way I was, or the way people are. Um, you know, it's it's just some people seem to let things go over them quite easily, and others really take it personally, and they question themselves a lot, does it mean, did I do something wrong? But it's a behavior. And it's not a healthy behavior to be unrealistically self-critical, because it, it stops you from becoming adaptable. If you become quite negative in your thinking, and that self-criticism can actually spill out into criticism of other people, and which again then becomes a trigger for them. So it's about being more reflective and reflecting on conflicts and saying, what am I learning here? What's, what's good information that I can bring forward? How can I change? Rather than criticizing yourself for being it in the first place. I think that makes sense? Yeah? Any questions on that? Any behavior, please? So some of it is about just stating some of the obvious. There's no big science in any of this that, that are new behaviors we haven't all heard about or thought about. But it's about becoming self-aware enough to say, you know what, the next time I'm triggered, I'm going to do something slightly different from before. Because change happens in the small spaces. It doesn't happen in changing my personality or changing the entirety of how I approach conflict. But it changes in the small change that I might make next time. So if I'm having a conversation with somebody who always, which always seems to go bad, maybe next time I'll say less. Or maybe next time in my situation I'll say more, a little bit more. But those small marginal changes can really help to keep you in that green constructive zone. And we're looking for that, I suppose, as a culture at least, we're looking for those norm, those behaviours to become the norms within the workplace. And how do we do that? We say we do that in a number of ways. We do it through conflict management training. So we hold workshops with employees, with managers. And I think that culture, culture comes from the top. I think culture, culture change certainly comes from the top. We need your senior management you know, modeling these behaviours. If they don't believe in them, then you know, I don't think that people at the lower levels of the organisation will see the work like that because they're not going to be enforced and they're going to be supported. Um, self-awareness, coaching, training, building self-awareness, assessment tools, using all of these techniques to build self-awareness and um, that people become aware of their impact on the others around them and how, that, how, to, make, how to retain that sense of constructive positivity. Self-mediation. How do I conduct successful conversa difficult conversations? How do I use the behaviours in a real conversation with somebody with whom I'm in conflict? Learning those techniques. Again, going back to training. And managerial mediation. As a manager, then, how do I, how do I conduct a constructive uh, mediation or meeting between two of my subordinates, two of my direct reports that are in conflict. What are the skills that I need to do that? Because many times managers don't intervene because they're afraid. They're afraid they'll make it worse, they make the situation worse, or that they don't have the skills or training to have those conversations earlier in the conflict, where the options are greater and the possibility of finding those solutions is greater. If you allow the, the conflict to continue um, and to become entrenched, it's more difficult to dislodge the beliefs that people have and the entrenchedness that they have. So how to do that as a manager? And then everything does not have to go to the HR, nor should it. There should be, I suppose, the, the, the capacity and the confidence there uh, with supervisors, with managers at every level to be able to have these types of conversations. And professional mediation, if things don't work out, if managers try to mediate, if HR tries to and it doesn't work, bring in professional mediators. Have a, have a whole series of different techniques, of um, options available to you, so that you don't panic if things don't go well. You can then keep increasing the, the, the level of intervention that you need. 
Um, and then conflict management coaching is another option where mediation is not a possibility. To work with one or two parties separately um, to help them to, to come to the resolution. So there are all sorts of new methods, strategies, techniques emerging um, in this whole field. I think many of our codes of practice and our direction is open, you know, resolve it locally, resolve it the most well possible, as informally as possible. But what does that mean in terms of techniques, procedures, and tangible methods that I can bring to my work? Um, and I guess I think that there should be um, a systematic approach to this, a systems approach, where you're, you're working with individuals around self-awareness, with managers around intervention and the skills to intervene early and the company's policies to train, provide training, even for training the trainer types of programs in-house, that you have this um, skill set in-house. And again, there are many ways to measure it. Um, I'm not going to go through these because we're running out of time, but I think I just want to say, look, think strategically. Um, the conflict can be, it is constructive when it is approached constructively. It is the energy with which companies innovate, create and grow. Um, act decisively. It is inevitable. So be decisive in how you act around it. Um, and resource it adequately. I think piecemeal doesn't work. I think you need a systematic approach and to put in procedures and policies within your organisation that recognise it in advance, know it's going to, be, to happen and plan for it. Um, measure performance. There are many different measurements. We have cost of conflict calculators that can calculate the costs of conflict. We have cultural um, assessments that can, can assess and measure the culture. We have data from individual assessment tools. There are many different ways. You have your stats, your HR stats around absenteeism, presenteeism. We can measure the impact of our investment. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.